I'm Zach Walker, and this is the DIUX podcast. I'm joined today by Lieutenant Colonel Mark Jacobson, founder and former leader of DIU's Rogue Squadron. Mark, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Zach. Great to be here. Could you tell us a bit more about Rogue Squadron, give it background and what it's done for DIU? Yeah, happy to. So Rogue Squadron is a software development team that me and some colleagues founded at DIUX maybe two years ago. And it very specifically deals with small unmanned aircraft systems, small UAS or drones, as well as counter drone technology. And it got its beginning a couple of years ago, really in Iraq, when our troops started to encounter small drones on the battlefield in a big way. This was in the Battle of Mosul against the Islamic State. And very quickly, ISIS went from having no drone capability to flying swarms of sometimes 12 aircraft at a time dropping grenades on our troops. It became an urgent problem. The SOCOM commander called it his most daunting challenge of that year. It's since become a huge problem across the entire DOD as well as the rest of the federal government, state government, local government. And as DOD was scrambling for solutions, we saw the need to create a red team that could essentially act like insurgents inside government to understand drone technology and understand how to counter it and to vet technologies that were being offered. At the time, I had run a nonprofit for a couple of years in the past trying to do humanitarian work with small drones. My colleague, Navy Lieutenant Ryan Beal, had spent a lot of his career doing small drone engineering at the Naval Academy and later at Naval Postgraduate School. And we were fortunate to end up both at DIUX helping out uh, from the sidelines. I was at Stanford at the time. Ryan was at Naval Postgraduate School. So we were helping consult on a counter UAS task force. And we conceived of the idea of Rogue Squadron to be a red team, uh, help us understand these threats. Over time, we got drawn more and more into capability development, and we moved away from red teaming to software development. And over the last couple of years, really grew the team out to the point where we're about 16 people uh, developing and maintaining a number of software applications that either added capability to our troops UAS or gave them additional capabilities to defeat small UAS. So it started as a red team under the autonomy portfolio and then morphed into something that was more of a capability development. How was that? How did that come about being established under the autonomy team? What was the relationship like? Because you were part of the autonomy group, but also again, rogue as you have in your name. Just talk a bit more about those dynamics. Yeah, sure. So obviously the primary mission of DIUX and now DIU is to find commercial technology and leverage that to solve warfighter problems. The autonomy portfolio was specifically working on the small UAS and counter UAS problem sets, trying to leverage commercial tech. When Ryan and I joined, we started sitting in meetings with companies and this is, you know, a brand new technology. It's emerging, particularly counter drone. It's a very difficult problem. None of the technologies are very mature. And we sat in a lot of different pitches and we're realizing that there needed to be a high level of technical vetting to understand what was going to work in the field and what wouldn't. And the best way to do that was get out on a range with real drones and you know, test a company out on the range versus just looking at their pitch deck. So that was how we started. And we saw that as part of autonomy's role, that we could be the subject matter, subject matter experts on small UAS for the autonomy portfolio. However, one of the things that really changed is once we started writing software, we developed some capabilities that met really critical needs in the DOD. One of those capabilities actually got on the Secretary of Defense's radar, Secretary Mattis at the time. He visited DIUX a couple years ago, saw one of the software applications that Ryan had developed, and said, this is a critical capability that we need. I want you to scale that across the entire DOD. Out of that, we got some initial funding and were able to start hiring. And when your marching orders come directly from the secretary, that was all the mandate that we needed to kind of move in a different direction with software development. I will say that did remain a challenge though, particularly in the last year, DIU has really 
consolidated its business model around the CSO and around um, primarily working with commercial technology. So some of the earlier work DIUX did on software development through Kessel Run and then later through Rogue Squadron just isn't part of the DIU mission set now as it's understood by r and leadership. So we had a couple great years carrying out the secretary's request of us on software development, but there also came a point that we had to kind of find a new home for Rogue Squadron outside DIU under an organization that was better aligned with what we did. As far as the human capital piece of this, you had mentioned you had subject matter experts, you had people that could do software development, right? These are things that the DOD has a hard time getting. And even when the SecDef says, go do something, it certainly doesn't mean that the human capital will just show up, especially when it comes to something so nascent as, as at the time anyway, counter UAS. How was Rogue structured in the early days so that you could get the right talent quickly and retain them to work on some of these really pressing issues? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And my personal philosophy of leadership and innovation is that the absolute most important thing is getting the right people in place on a problem. And that's very difficult in DOD where you very rarely have much control over who gets assigned to you. Almost everybody's a generalist. It's very difficult to get specialists. And in my view, for a problem as specialized as counter UAS, you really need a devoted team of specialists. So that was our challenge. Ryan and I both had years of experience writing software for small drones prior to starting Rogue. So it was kind of an alignment of stars that we ended up in the same place at the same time. And when we were told by the secretary to go and scale, we had this scaling challenge for talent. We weren't going to get the talent through normal DOD uh, talent pipelines. DIUX didn't have the bodies around. So we had to kind of start from scratch and we had to get creative. The first thing we did is start activating our networks through Facebook and LinkedIn, trying to find people. One of the first people we found, uh, Ensign Dan Flack, fresh out of the Naval Academy, uh, we heard about just through a friend and he was in a casual status after graduating from the Naval Academy, waiting to start his official career training. And we reached out to his commander and were able to get him to come out TDY, temporary duty, basically just paying short term for him. So that was the very first thing we did because he was a phenomenal computer science uh, graduate. We gave him a kind of a challenge one day before Ryan got on an airplane. And by the time Ryan had landed, he had knocked the assignment out of the park. So he joined us. And for a while, it was just the three of us working out of literally a, an empty cage in a warehouse used for storage. And the three of us were just writing code. The next thing we did is we had to leverage a contractor. We basically had three choices. We could try and get government people uh, or military officers. We could use government civilians or we could use contractors. Uh, the military talent is a challenge because what I mentioned, it's so hard to get the right people. Government civilians is a challenge because the hiring process is so slow. You don't have a lot of control over who you get and it's very difficult to fire people if that becomes necessary. The pay scale also maxes out at a salary that makes it very difficult to get people in Silicon Valley where the cost of living is so high. The last option was a contractor where we essentially pay a contractor to go out and find people for us. DIUX had an existing manpower contract at the time and the easiest way for us to grow was to put some money on that contract to create new positions for software developers and then work with the contractor to hire them. Uh, that was not easy. The first round of candidates the contractor brought to us were severely underqualified for what we needed. Uh, one of the first things we did after that happened was got on LinkedIn and Facebook and activated our own networks. Uh, Ryan and I both have pretty deep networks in the UAS space saying, hey, if you want to come work for Rogue Squadron, reach out to the contractor. And we immediately got in trouble from about five different directions because we're not allowed to recruit for our contractor. So that was a lesson learned, but through time, it was a lot of partnering with the contractor that we were able to get in the right people. And it took a long time. We spent months hiring or recruiting for each position, which is very different from how DOD usually deals with its contractors that you just kind of take who you're given by the contractor. So we kept going back to the contractor saying, no, 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 these people aren't good enough to the point they were getting very exasperated with us 
but one by one, we found the right people and brought them into the team. I remember Ryan telling me that, and it was a new perspective for me, as he said, every person is handpicked and really just even one bad apple could likely spoil the entire culture. Could you speak a bit more about that and specifically what that culture was that was so special? Yeah, so that's exactly right. We wanted to make sure that every single hire was, was excellent. And I think we did a pretty good job at that. We had what I call a high trust culture, meaning that we didn't have a lot of peripheral members. You were either all the way in Rogue Squadron or you were not a part of it at all. So when we brought someone in, we, we put our arm around you and pulled you all the way in. We implicitly trusted everyone on the team. It was like a pickup sports game. There was a lot of intersection between projects. No one person had all the skills that you would need. Everybody was constantly learning new skills to keep up with emerging technology. So you had to be very collaborative, working together, trusting each other, and trusting that every person on the team was excellent. So the things we hired for was not so much raw technical ability. It was two things. The first one was mission focus, that if you wanted to be part of Rogue Squadron, we needed to believe that you would do whatever it took to support our warfighters and support your team. And the second one was your aptitude to learn. We wanted self-starters who, if they were given a problem, would use every resource to learn. I think we did a pretty effective job at that, building a team of people who were very fast learners, very adaptive and very collaborative in solving problems. Speaking of problems that you tackled, I'd love to know, I know you can't share everything, but what you can say, what did Rogue accomplish? So in the two years or so that I led the team, Rogue very quickly became known as probably the top center of experts for small UAS and counter UAS in not just DOD, but the entire federal government, as well as allied countries. So. That was largely because of the quality of people on the team. Ryan in particular, when he walked into a room, small UAS conference, for example, it, he would step up to the microphone and everyone would listen because they knew he knew more about small drones than almost anybody. So there was a, a matter of bringing in subject matter expertise. In terms of specific projects, there are limits to what we can talk about but we developed a number of software applications that were being used very widely around the world. We did a forensic tool that could be used to extract time-sensitive intelligence from drones that were recovered by our troops. That was deployed globally through one of our uh, warfighter communities. There is a big concern in the drone industry with the fact that a lot of drone technology is foreign made. The whole industry really grew out of a hobby industry that was centered in China. So there's a lot of security concerns and questions about the degree to which we can trust small US technology. That's where our team spent a lot of its time and did some of the leading work in understanding and mitigating concerns with foreign made drones. We also worked closely with the DIU commercial solutions opening process and the autonomy team to kind of sketch out a blueprint for how you might move American drones off of foreign supply chains. So one of the biggest CSO efforts DIU has done is the short range reconnaissance drone, which is a small UAS program for the army. It's an army led program that DIU is the contracting authority for. And there was a lot of people who had a hand in that, that was led by the autonomy team, but the rogue squadron team played a pretty critical role in the early days of sketching out how you might use the CSO to fund technology and get to a more trusted quadcopter. And we worked hand in hand with the autonomy team on that. And uh, that now is a fairly mature program where, you know, prototypes are being flown today by some market leading companies that will provide a good alternative to untrusted foreign made drones. You mentioned working hand in hand with the autonomy team. Do you think there's room for a rogue squadron, whatever it would be called, in the different areas that DIU focuses on, cyber, AI, having people that are truly subject matter experts be able to back up projects with essentially developers? I would like to think that, but it's complicated. The magic of rogue squadron wasn't just that we were subject matter experts, is that we could actually build things internally and field them immediately. 
industry can't just pass things directly into use downrange in combat by our troops. For me as a military officer, or for Ryan as a military officer, it was a little bit different that we had a level of access inside government where we could reach for things off the shelf commercially. We could add our own twists and tweaks with software. We could write custom things when we needed it. We could often get it directly into use very quickly because of where we sat. So for us, it wasn't just about building things ourselves. We wanna use industries capabilities when we can, but when technology moves so fast, there has to be a role, I think, for uniformed military officers to create needed capabilities, particularly with software. It's very rare you find a piece of commercial technology that can just be used as it stands. So Rogue was able to do that. However, the idea of military officers creating software did not sit well with certain people uh, in the Pentagon and elsewhere who thought that we were overstepping DIU's charter and also were concerned that we might be competing with industry itself. And that is a valid concern that we always took really seriously, that we didn't want to just be competing with companies. But we tried to find niches where we could do things the industry couldn't or we could partner with industry to do certain projects. So as long as that hesitancy is there or that resistance is there, it's going to be hard for another rogue squadron to take root at DAU or elsewhere. The other challenge is getting the right people. We really had an alignment of stars to get the right people at the right place at the right time. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of confidence in DOD's ability to generate those teams in the future. It really takes strong leadership, strong protection from above, and just a dogged determination to fight the personnel system to get the people that you need. What I've seen at DIU and at other organizations in DOD doing defense, you maybe can get a f that, that perfect group of people together for a while, but it's very hard to sustain it over time. Once the personnel system gets its talons back into you, it's hard to keep, keep that level of quality. Ryan Beal, my deputy, even though he was considered one of the top UAS experts in the country, and did phenomenal work, he was passed over for promotion twice because he wasn't flying helicopters anymore, which is the one thing the Navy personnel system valued. So because he was not promoted, he was actually involuntarily separated from the service recently and is no longer with Rogue Squadron. These are the kind of problems we need to fix to keep teams together led by uniformed military officers. I'm sorry to hear that. That's a huge loss for Rogue and honestly for the nation. What would you say would be the legacy of Rogue when it transitions fully into DDS? Yeah, so I hope that the business model that we developed is a case study that can help other teams in the future, showing just like Kessel Run, how if you get the right people in the right place, you can do phenomenal things. DOD collectively is learning how to write software. Kessel Run played a part in that. There's other innovation organizations like Space Camp, Kobayashi Maru, Bespin, all these software factories standing up now is slowly turning the tide of how software is done. And Rogue is a big part of that, also showing how software can connect to physical devices like drones. And then specifically our projects, I do think the combined efforts of Autonomy and Rogue Squadron have led to some of the most, some of the most promising initiatives in steering the UAS market away from untrusted foreign supply chains. So that's a big one. And then I haven't talked as much about our counter UAS work, but the biggest project that we've been doing really for the last year has been more on the counter side. And this is an area where our companies really are critical. It's gonna be companies that build drone detection systems, companies that build defeat systems. That's not something we're gonna build in Rogue Squadron. But when you have so many companies building pieces, you need a government entity in the middle that can integrate it all together. And Rogue really broke new ground there because we were developing a cloud-based counter UAS system with automated telemetry, continuous integration and deployment of software daily direct to the field. It was bringing those software best practices to the construction of a counter UAS network which really was a generational leap forward from the approach B-52 
being used by a lot of our other defense programs. That's the one I'm most excited about and one that I hope DDS is able to keep leading. That's a great legacy. What do you wish you had known now if you go back to day one of yourself in DIUX? Well, it's probably a good thing I didn't know how much work it was going to be. I'm not sure I would have done it otherwise. It's hard work. Um, what I wish I'd known, I think there's a lot of practical skills involved in doing innovation in government. A lot of us who care about innovation read books from the private sector. We read things like design thinking and innovators dilemma and lean startup. But really to be effective in government, you've got to be a master of government systems. You've got to know how money works. You've got to know how contracting works. You've got to know subtle nuances of how the personnel system works. And we don't do a very good job training people in those things, but those are the skills that became critical where if we made one mistake putting a contract together, we could eliminate getting the right people or we could create some kind of catastrophic problem we wouldn't even realize until later. We had to understand money to keep a budget together. So understanding the importance of being able to master those skills early would have been helpful. Most of DOD's processes are optimized for consensus, instability, and risk mitigation, which means you pay a price in speed. But in today's world where technology moves so fast, you could get three or four generational leaps in drone technology in a single year, speed becomes its own source of advantage and being able to move fast is a critical part of mitigating risk. So you're, you're trading one kind of risk for another. And what Rogue Squadron did was take on certain kinds of risk, but in exchange, we got very good at responding to, or even sometimes anticipating new technology and being able to field 80% solutions immediately. Um, so you can't build everything that way. You're not gonna build an F-22 that way. But for what we were doing with trying to keep up or, or even stay ahead of emerging drone technology, being able to move fast on those integration challenges is critical. And to be able to do that, you really have to go rogue. And so the name was, was really perfect. Mark, anything, right. else that, anything else that we missed that you wanna say? No, it's been a pleasure talking. I hope that our story can help inspire other teams in the future to do similar work. I look forward to seeing what other innovators and their teams do. Thank you, Mark and Ryan and the rest of the team that did such amazing work for Rogue Squadron. Thank you for joining us today and sharing your story. Absolutely, Zach, I appreciate it. 